uh, you were careful. Of course you were careful. You got caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. You'd be thrown in jail for a couple of nights or something. Uh, I've always known I'm, I was gay, always. 15, 16, but I actually admitted it to myself when I was in my mid-20s, because in those days it was very difficult um, to admit to being gay because you were quite ostracised. Oh, forever. You know, it's a case of when did you realise you were heterosexual? It's, it was ever thus. I was brought up in Bournemouth um, with my mum and dad, and I've got one older brother. Um, I'd come up to Manchester to university, and in the first year I was here, um, I met somebody. I didn't tell anyone in Bournemouth, but when I came up here, I was free to do what I liked, so I did that. When I, when I first started to come out, I was very, very, um, introverted with it because I didn't want people to know. Um, I was probably 24 when I told my really, really closest friend and I swore him to secrecy. His reaction was very surprised because it's not like nowadays, if you're gay, you can camp it up a bit. You had to repress all those feelings, so no one knew. I came out to my family one Christmas when I went down to Bournemouth uh, for the holidays. Not over Christmas dinner, but I think it was Boxing Day. Uh, they were very upset, indeed. I've never actually come out to my family. I've never, I've always thought, why should I go to anybody and say I'm gay? You know, my brother didn't go to my mother and say, I've got something to tell you, I'm heterosexual. So why should I go and say, I've got something to tell you, I'm gay? It's my business and nobody else's, and that's how I've always felt about it. In my later life in Bournemouth, when I was between, say, 15 and 18, I dated girls and tried to pretend that I wasn't gay, to keep up the facade, and to try it for myself to see if, you know, I was maybe mistaken. Um, but by that time, I, I was certain of what I was. I was engaged when I was 17 to a woman. Uh, I did a runner, I joined the Merchant Navy. Now, subconsciously, it might have been because I thought I may be gay, but I wasn't really sure. But what I was sure was, I didn't want to get married, have kids, and have what I saw as a fixed life. I, I met someone when I was 26, called Steve. Uh, we met in Stockport in Stockport Market. Steve was on his lunch break and I was on home leave from the Merchant Navy. And we, I can remember it. Steve will tell a different story this, but he's got a, not of as good a memory as I've got long term. And we were, he was walking across the, uh, there's a bridge in Stockport that you walk over to actually go into the market. And we just, our eyes just met and I turned around and followed him. And I followed him for about three quarters of an hour. And I was thinking, is he a policeman? Because in those days, they would send a good-looking copper out. If somebody gay approached him, you'd be done for soliciting. I followed him down Portwood, and there's some public toilets there. Now, this might be frowned upon nowadays. Oh, gay men, men going in public toilets. Where else did we meet? There was n absolutely nowhere. Steve walked into the toilets. I was stood outside thinking, should I go in, should I go in? Could be a policeman, I could get arrested. And I thought, oh, sod it. I just went over to him and I said to him, are you a copper? Are you a policeman? And he said, no, I work at the town hall. So I said, oh, thank God for that. And we've been together now, that was like 40 years ago. It 
was into Manchester and that was almost like the Mecca. It, it wasn't called a village at that point because it was only one or two bars uh, at that stage. And all the very early gay bars were basically dives where people on the fringe of society used to go to. So it would be, all, it would be a mixture of gay people and, you know, rent boys and prostitutes. And I actually remember going into the, the nightclub for the first time and I remember walking around the block, plucking up courage to actually go into this place. In those days, you were frightened of being seen coming out of a gay pub in case you got beat up, harassed. The straight society tried to hide the gay uh, culture because they didn't understand it. And we were allowing ourselves to be hidden. And I remember knocking on the door and at that point, clubs had sort of bouncers and it was almost like a little um, door will open up and it was like, yes, what do you want? Type of thing. I was like, oh, I want to come in. Um, they peeked at you as you went in. Are you? And then they say to you, do you know what kind of place this is? Just in case you'd made a mistake, you know. I was just like shaking like a leaf when I went in because I just had no idea what to expect at all. I mean, Canal Street at one time, it was the, the, the union at the end, the Rembrandt, which um, was run by a gay landlord, and the Thompson's Arms underneath Chalton Street bus station, they were the only bars. So you could go out on a, on a Saturday night and you could do the three bars as a circuit and all your friends would be in those bars. It would be great, it was a great scene. There were two organisations at the time, which was the Gay Liberation Front and the Campaign for Homosexual Equality. Now the Gay Liberation Front was very much, ba you know, kind of agitprop based on direct action. And the uh, CHE um, was more kind of, uh, more middle class approach, lobbying parliament and so on. And they eventually got the message and we got publicity. Yeah, I do remember when it happened. Uh, it made very little difference initially. Bit of an anticlimax, I think. I don't know why I expected. It wasn't kind of like a, one of those when um, John Kennedy was assassinated, do you remember where you were? It wasn't like that. It, the law was very strictly phrased which is why really the campaigning went on after 67, because what gay people thought was, uh, you know, uh, why don't we have total equality? People say legislation won't alter people's attitudes. I disagree. I think it really does, because it means the government's on your side if you're a minority. And I think that's a big statement coming from the government. And I think over time, it does alter perceptions. If there was no legislation on the books, we would be living in fear. I have no doubt about that. Yeah, I'm glad they did it. <sighs> well, I think what shaped the modern gay, thing, gay scene was people getting more politicalised about being gay and fighting back and saying enough's enough. Um, and just a higher profile of being gay and not being hid in a box. There's pros and cons really because now it's all out in the open. Um, the, the scene has become incredibly commercialised. Really, I think because it's become the gay village and it's the trendy place to go and you just get the wrong kind of people going down. It's, to me it feels like a goldfish bowl. I've heard guys sort of say, oh I've seen that tranny out there and ooh I've just seen two guys kissing, it's freaking me out sort of thing. I'm thinking, well, what the hell are you doing here then? I think the young people of today have almost lulled into a false sense of security. Because within the, the gay village, it's almost like you've got two streets of fairyland, of this supposed safe space. As soon as you step outside that, you're going to get your head kicked in. The problem I have with the gay culture at the moment is that there's not the history taught about the fight that it's taken for gay people to get here. So people tend to take it for granted. And I think once you start to take things for granted, you can be wrong-footed. And I think that's the fear that I have for the future.